And good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sunday School, the pastor's class. I am Mike Carey, the pastor of the First United Methodist Church of Nevada, Iowa. We are doing, working our way through principles of Christian growth, or the walk. It's an Adam Hamilton study, and I'm my privilege to be able to walk with you this morning. Sorry, we are getting on just a little bit late this morning. Service went overly long this morning. It was a special service if you were watching on Facebook live stream. Uh, we were celebrating uh, getting the mortgage paid off early, which is always a good and wonderful thing. So we had a mortgage burning. We had our district superintendent here and I had made a little gentleman's wager with the church as far as being able to get it done before the end of the year, which involved shaving my head. So this is not a new look on my part. It is a shaved head, so, which we ju just got done completing. And um, you'll notice it's, it's stubble. The crew cut is back and uh, everybody tells me it's looking good. Uh, I thought they were going to go right down to uh, making it shine. However, Sue Browns, whose clippers we were using, Sue used to cut hair, uh, said that she had one more setting lower on her clippers, but that one reads, make them bleed. So <laughs> they, they were merciful to me that way, and they didn't do that. I'm going to reach around here, and I'm going to grab my coffee cup. And uh, But we had a big time, big service, great service. I hope you can watch it online. And uh, with our district superintendent, uh, Reverend Dr. Hichon Jiang, uh, was uh, presiding this morning and sharing the Word of God, and it was just uh, a great time to be together with God's people. Also, to be able to wish you uh, a safe, happy Thanksgiving this coming Thursday. This was also a Thanksgiving service. And so we're rejoicing in the Lord, in God's goodness, in His mercy, and just praying for a great and wondrous holiday season. Next Sunday is Advent, the first Sunday of Advent. Oh my goodness, how in the world did that happen and get here that quickly? Well, it has. So there you go. We will soon be officially into the holiday season. But we are continuing on with our study of the walk five principles for spiritual growth. If you want to grow as a Christian, you know, Christianity is not just something, well, you, you get baptized, you get confirmed, and that's it. You're a Christian. Now what? Uh, Christianity is something that is intended to be a dynamic experience, a growing experience, where you become more and more made into the image of Jesus Christ every day. That's the point. That's the goal. It's not just worship. Uh, it's not just serving. It's growing in your faith, becoming a stronger, more mature Christian. That's what we're talking about here. And yes, I got my Vikings cup. Show your horns and uh, go Vikes today against the Packers. The Packers. Mm. And uh, they were also going to do face painting on me today. But um, turns out they forgot the face paint, which, <laughs> lucky me. <laughs> and uh, But we're talking about reading scripture as part of uh, growing in the faith. And as a Christian, we are to live by the Bible. Well, how are you going to live by the principles of the Bible if you don't read the Bible, if you don't study the Bible? And most Christians would probably agree with that statement. However, they might also counter with, but the Bible is not an easy book to understand. How do, how do I read the Bible? How do I understand the Bible? I don't read it like it's a novel. Tom Clancy novel or something like that. Um, there are definite ways in which you should, could read the scripture. And I'm going to give you a method here now. It's called Lecto Divina, uh, which is Latin, which means divine reading. Uh, if the Bible is inspired by God and by the Holy Spirit, if it is authoritative in terms of it uh, showing us and telling us how we should live, well, then reading it, the way we read it, should be different than our casual divina reading. And so Lecto Divina is a specific way of reading scripture. And I want to just share that with you this morning as our, in our time together. Uh, but the goal, the goal of Lecto Divina is communion with God through the reading of the Holy Scripture. Um, one of the interesting ways I saw this being exhibited is in the third Indiana Jones movie, 
which features, uh, along with Harrison Ford, one of my favorite actors, uh, Sean Connery, another one of my favorite actors, playing the role of Indiana Jones's father, uh, Harrison Ford's character, Indiana Jones, and uh, Do as Dr. Jones. And in the early part of the movie, which is a flashback to when Indiana Jones was a teenager, uh, you have his father practicing Lecto Divina. Most people probably wouldn't realize that, but uh, he's praying as he's reading Holy Scripture and as he's studying. So let me just share what Lecto Divina is. It's not that complicated. This is not a heavy-duty academic uh, construct for you at all. The first idea is, before you read, pray. Now, wouldn't that make sense? You're reading God's Word. You're going to be reading that about God. Pray. You, know, I, you don't have to pray this specific prayer, but something like this. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. This goes back to the child uh, Samuel, when Samuel was in the temple as a child, and uh, God called him, and he thought it was uh, the high priest that was calling to him, and he went, and the high priest, you know, a couple of times said, no, no, I, I didn't call you. And so finally, uh, the third time, the high priest realized, ah, something's going on here, something of a divine nature. And he said, okay, when the voice calls to you again, simply say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening, which is what the young boy Samuel did. And that is, that is always a good thing. When, <laughs> when, the Apostle Paul, before he was Paul and he was Saul, uh, was on his way to Damascus. God was probably trying to speak to him through that time, but uh, he wasn't listening very well. So to get his attention, uh, God struck him with lightning, knocked him flat on his back. And it was, okay, you've got my attention now. I'm listening to you. Actually, Saul's actual response was, who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, why do you kick against the goats, Paul? Paul says, well, who are you? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So the first thing you do before you read scripture is pray, speak, Lord, I'm listening. Your servant is listening. I'm paying attention here now. And then read a short portion of scripture. Oftentimes in reading scripture, less is more. So keep it short. That's the reading. That's the lecto. Um, now, what do I mean by short? Well, you'll be the one that'll have to determine that. Uh, short can be, you know, just a couple of verses. Uh, it could be uh, a, a section, a paragraph. It could be a chapter. Uh, make make sure you get the complete thought of what it is that you're reading. But um, pray before you read, and then read. Now, after your initial reading, pray again. And pray something like this, Lord, speak to me through this scripture. Then read it again. Only this time read it slower. Think about each phrase that's there. If you've got, uh, like you're reading a paragraph, several sentences. Now, this is known as med meditato, or meditating on the past passage. The first, set, first thing is lecto, the first reading. The second reading is meditato. It's reading it slowly, thinking about it, kind of letting it sink in. The third time, this is called contemplato. Now, you read the third time, but before you do, you ask yourself now. Not so much a prayer, but you ask yourself, how does this idea, this word, this phrase, this text relate to me? How does this relate to me in terms of what it is that I'm reading right now? Uh, to contemplate, to think about contemplation. Um, it's not just hurry up, read it, and get done. And, and some people do that. Well, I've had my, my quiet time today. I, I've done my reading, and, you know, and off you go. No. Contemplate. Ask yourself, what does this idea, how does this text, this phrase relate to me? And then the last is called orato, uh, and that's Latin for prayer. Enter into conversation with God about what you've just read, 
about the ideas and the thoughts that might have come to you in your meditation. Uh, it's good to have a, a tablet and pen or pencil with you to be able to jot down thoughts, ideas, but then to go to God and say, okay, Lord, this is what I think I'm hearing and seeing and understanding in this particular passage. Uh, what do you think? What? How, how do you, Lord, want me to respond to this and to this idea? It basically, uh, or, or, or Tato is, so what? It's the big so what? I mean, you've read it, you've studied it, you've come to an understanding, now so what? What are you going to do about this? What does this say to you? What kind of action should you be taking about this? See, that's what I mean about Christianity being dynamic. It's not just, it's not good enough just to read. It's to read and understand, but understand isn't enough. It's to read, understand, and apply under divine guidance. Lord, what, what are you saying to me here? What do you want me to do? How, if I yield myself to your power and your leading, how is this going to change me? How do you want to change me, Lord? Uh, God wants to change me? Yes, he does. Uh, always for the good. Always for the good. And that's not to say that you're not good enough as you are. You are good enough. But we can all be made better. We're all being made into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what God wants. Now, this does not have to be. You think you might be thinking, wow, this, this sounds like it's very time consuming. No, it does not have to be. Uh, you can take as long as you want. Or you can do it in 10, 15 minutes. And if you can't give God 10, 15 minutes out of your day, then there's something wrong, okay? It's pure and simple. I'll just say it like it is. But I promise you, if you put in the time and the effort, this will deepen and enrich your encounter of God through the Holy Scripture. Uh, I guarantee you it will. The more time you spend in the Scripture, in prayer, in conversation with God, asking God to lead you, and to guide you and to help you to grow, that will happen. I guarantee you, I promise you, that will happen. Now, another aspect in terms of reading Holy Scripture is the idea of studying with others. Uh, small group Bible study, even larger group Bible study as far as that go. Um, Bible study can be done individually, of course. That's what we've been talking about. But there is a powerful element that comes into play when you study the Bible with others. Um, people coming together, uh, e even just two people together, uh, because it, when you're with other people, you just can't help but to learn something new. Um, I have a small group of guys I meet with on, on Wednesday morning. And that's our men's Bible study. And by the way, anybody can come to it. We start at um, 6:30, but um, and we and we we do it for an hour. And we're doing a systematic reading through uh, this Bible. We're in the Old Testament right now, using uh, the Serendipity Bible Study Guide Bibles, uh, which has questions built in. It's it's real easy to do, but um, when you sit down and study it with other people, you're bringing somebody else's perspective into play, you're bringing somebody else's experience and their relationship with God into play, and you're allowing that those individual searchlights to shine on your own life and your own path. And so when people come together and they study together, they learn together, uh, they come side by side, relationships form in those kinds of setting, uh, trust levels happen in those kinds of settings. You can be encouraged and strengthened in those kinds of settings as, as well as learn. You can also, there's also in those kinds of groups, they can be called accountability groups where, you know, you talk to each other. That was actually one of the genius aspects of the early Wesleyan movement of early Methodism with John Wesley. He had what he called classes or small groups or bands. And they would meet on a regular basis, weekly basis, to study and to give account of their Christian lives. What, 
you know, what were they bringing into play? What were they doing? How, how were they sharing their Christian walk? And it was highly effective. And I say, well, why should I be accountable to other people? Well, when you come together, for example, as a team, say football team, since go Vikings, uh, beat the Packers uh, today, um, you are, you are, you have as a team member, you have a specific assignment on each individual play that you have to carry out. If you carry out your assignment successfully, and if everybody, I'll say on the offense, executes their role in the play successfully, the play will succeed. It will gain yardage, maybe even score a touchdown. If you fail in your aspect of the play and its execution, uh, probably the play will fail. And, I mean, you could have 10 people execute their, their part, and if one fails, the entire play fails. Well, that person, you know, the rest of the team holds that person accountable for whether or not they succeeded. And you, know, you feel like you, you want to succeed, you want to play hard, work hard, because you have the other guys that you're playing with and playing for. So it's a team effort. Christianity is a team effort. Our superintendent, Dr. Hichan uh, uh, Jiang, today was making that point that church is a team. If you're going to be part of a church, you're going to be part of a team. In other words, we all need to work together. We're all in this together as God's people. And uh, the better we work together, the more effective as a church, as the body of Christ, the more effective we're going to be. And so, and these kinds of groups can also be prayer support groups as well. As uh, we study together, we pray together, we work together, we become trusting of one another, we share various concerns, things that are going on in our lives, and people can pray for one another. And it's a powerful thing to know and to have someone praying for you and praying specifically. It's not enough to say to someone, I'll pray for you. A generic prayer is okay, but it is always better to pray specifically for someone and something, some specific aspect of that person's life. Um, I recall back when I was in seminary, I was serving as a staff person on a United Methodist Church out in the, the suburb of Lakeland, which is Washington County, east of St. Paul. And uh, it was in a, a really interesting situation. It was a um, lakeside town, small town, series of small towns. You had Lakeland, Lakeland Shores, uh, St. Croix Beach, and Afton, all kind of, you know, one after the other there. And um, it, it was a, a young, younger community, a lot of 3M people and control data people, uh, Burlington Northern people were moving out into that area and building homes. And so we had a lot of young families, but they were a lot of professional type individuals. So it, it was a real interesting bunch. And we, we had a, a really good Sunday school. And um, I was, at that time on staff, I was youth and education. And I was an education major in seminary. I started out with a master's in Christian education. And so part of, my, of one of my class projects was to start a teacher training program for the teachers in the Sunday school. And we would meet every Monday night from 7 to 8 o'clock, and we would do teacher training. We would cover various aspects of teaching, teaching technique, teaching the scriptures, understanding the scripture. It eventually, and the, the teachers that we had were just really, really uh, diligent in terms of showing up and being part of it. Uh, I just, I think back on that group and it still amazes me. But after a few months, I thought, well, okay, I have fulfilled my obligation to my class of starting this project, doing this project, and we can quit now, and thank you people for being so supportive. They didn't want to quit. They didn't want to quit. They had, they enjoyed getting together. They enjoyed the discipline of studying and praying together, and bonds and relationships were formed there, and that became uh, the basis 
the cadre, if you will, of uh, what became a lot of the core of that church and moving that church forward over the next yeah, 20, 20 years or so. Um, just the bonds there were just re- and a lot, some of the most unlikely people uh, became uh, extremely c- close and supportive of one another. And so when, when you gather together in groups, uh, you, you can't help but when you're studying the scripture, bonds form, relationships form, um, and you can have a profound impact upon um, encouraging one another. So I, I would encourage you to consider that if you're not part of a Bible study group, even if you do it online via Zoom, although that's nowhere near as good. Um, you know, that's my personal opinion. Maybe you, you, know, you can do that differently, and if you can, that's okay. But um, Bible study in groups, small groups, how many, you know, it could be as few as two. You, you can, if, if you'd have less than two, then you're an individual. But uh, two, three, four, half a dozen, a dozen, um, I think it's great. Now, the, when it comes though, to studying scripture, for me, and I'll, I'll share this with you, um, the ultimate understanding and reading of scripture is that Jesus Christ is God's Word in the flesh. Let me just reach over here and grab my Bible. Come here. And if you go to John's Gospel, John chapter 1, which is John's prologue, the beginning, and this is what we find there. In the beginning was the Word, and it's referring to Jesus, because Jesus is called the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, move over to verse 14. And this Word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, when God wanted to speak to us, wanted us to, beyond a shadow of a doubt, when he wanted us to hear and to understand, God did not write a book. God sent a person. He sent Jesus, his son. Jesus was and is God's word made flesh. So how do we come to know this Jesus who is God's word made flesh? Well, through our life of prayer. When you pray, you say, well, who, who am I praying to? You are praying by the power of the Holy Spirit, which resides in you as a Christian. And you are praying through the Son, because Jesus is the one who gives us access to God the Father. So you're praying to God the Father through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how the triune God works. But Jesus is God's Word made flesh. So how do we know him? We know him by our life of prayer. Uh, You praise the name of Jesus in prayer. Uh, You speak the name of Jesus in prayer. Uh, You pray to him. You tell him that you love him. And you uh, love him for all that he has done and all that he is doing in your life uh, because his is the act of salvation. Uh, His shed blood, his suffering, the cup of his suffering, uh, his love for us, his broken body, all of that shows just how much he loves us. So we also then have our experience of him in our daily lives. Um, When I've taught preaching classes over the years, um, one of the questions, you know, everybody's got one sermon in them. And once they get that out, the next question, the hard thing is, now what? And, you know, how do you come up with sermon number two? Sermon one really isn't all that hard. It's sermon two and thereafter. That becomes when you get into the work of it. And I always tell people that you, as a preacher, if you're going to be a preacher, you have to look at life differently. You have to look at life sermonically. In other words, you have to look for the hand of God. And the hand of God is there in everything. Uh, If It's there if you want to see it. And so 
that's that's what you need to do you need to look for the experience of god in your daily life how is god speaking to you uh, god is speaking to me yes um is he speaking loudly so that you can hear beyond a shadow of a doubt probably not because god wants you to know that you care enough that you're really listening it's again the story of elijah on the mountaintop um and the fire and the wind and the earthquake came god was not in any of those things and then an awesome silence came and elijah wrapped his cloak around his head and went out and god spoke in the silence it's still small voice it said elijah why are you here and so god speaks remember you you're going to hear what you're listening for you're going to see what you're looking for if you're looking for the bad you're going to find bad if you're looking for the hand of God, you will see the hand of God, because as far as I'm concerned, it's there, it's self-evident. So, but the primary way of knowing Jesus is through the Gospels, and I would encourage you in terms of your, your reading of Scripture to read at least one Gospel a year, minimum. Now, I'm not saying that you don't read them all, you can if you want to, but at least one gospel a year, and I would encourage you to start with the gospel of Mark, because Mark's the easiest one of all to understand. And and that's not saying that the rest of the Bible isn't important. It is. But if you want to know the word made flesh, God's ultimate word for us, that word is Jesus. And so read the gospels, because the gospels are the ones that are the primary source of his story. They reveal him to us, his mind, his heart, his ministry. And so, if you're just starting out, um, read a minimum of five verses a day, at least. Now, I'd encourage you to do more, but if you're really pressed for time and you're really just starting out and, and the Bible is just totally intimidating to you, Start small, but practice Lecto Divina with those five verses. And, you know, take it small bites at, at a time, chew them up carefully, swallow them carefully, and ask God, what are you saying here to me? What, what do you want me to do? Now, as you go along, I would encourage you, increase your reading. Don't just keep it at five verses, but um, set a goal. I'm a goal-oriented person. I like to set goals. Um, I like to make lists and then, you know, check them off as you go. But uh, make your goal by the end of a year, say, to be doing instead of five verses, five chapters. Make, you know, and work up to it gradually. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. And you don't get into shape uh, if you've been out of shape in one day. You've got to work up to things gradually. If all you can do is 10 push-ups, do 10 push-ups every day until you can do 12 push-ups, and then do 12 until you can do 15, and then do 15 until you can do 20. Just work your way up, slowly, surely, methodically. We are, after all, Methodists, and that's what it means. We are considered to be the most methodical of people. And so, but the main thing is, start in terms of your reading of Holy Scripture. The only way to begin is to begin. And so, make modest goals, but get started. Get into the habit. It's a holy habit. Uh, make it your divine date, if you will, every day. Uh, a particular, do it at the same time every day. Do it at the same place every day. Uh, if you have a desk or a table or whatever the case may be, Turn off the music, turn off the television, whatever the computer, your cell phone, turn them off. And that time is devoted solely and completely to God and to reading God's Word. And spend time in the Gospels. Don't start with John, start with Mark. Graduate then to Luke, then go to John. Save Matthew for last. But begin. You know, the only way to begin is to begin. And so I would encourage you to do that. Um, set your goals, set them modestly, 
but get at it. There's nothing to it but to do it. Now, starting next Sunday, we will get into the next of the pillars of the walk, uh, which is service, the whole idea of service. And um, we'll talk about that more next time. This is the old cue ball here <laughs> signing off, and I hope the Lord blesses you real good.